Hi there, and welcome to our Recovering Regents in the Cape of Tea Valley webinar. This webinar is organised by the Central Tablelands Local Land Services and is hosted by me, Joanna Haddock, from the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. We recorded this webinar on a very miserable, rainy Saturday morning on the 24th of July 2021. And we hope you enjoy the few speakers we have over the next few hours. So firstly, we will be hearing from Mick Roderick from BirdLife Australia, then Dr. Ross Crate from the Australian National University. Thirdly, after the break, we'll hear from Dr. Monique Van Sluis from Taronga Zoo. And finally, we'll hear from Evelyn Nicholson at Central Tablelands LLS about the on-ground action at the Cape Tea Valley. All right. Nothing yet. Maybe. Already exists. Okay. I'll, I'll just hit replace. So this, the, the talk is just loading. Uh, for, for everyone's info, I'm based in, in Newcastle, so I work mostly in the Hunter, but uh, I work closely with, with Ross and Liam, who is online as well from ANU, and my supervisor is Dean Inglison, who is the, the Regent Honey to Recovery Coordinator. So it's fair to say I think BirdLife and ANU are the, probably the two most active uh, groups in the recovery of the Regent Honey Eater. And as Ev mentioned, we've learned a lot from Ross's um, PhD research over the last few years. Okay. Now, is everybody happy with that view? Yeah. All right. Because it's it's a bit small for me, but that's okay. I've I've, I've seen this. Um, so I am going to focus a bit on on noisy miners because that was the, the original um, the original workshop. I guess was going to be a focus on noisy miners, but it was a great idea to sort of broaden the context just to give everyone uh, a bit of an idea of what's happening with uh, with Regent Honey Eaters. But firstly, just to set the scene, I just wanted to point out that um, the Regent Honey Eater isn't the only woodland bird um, in decline. Uh, this is actually a very diverse uh, group of birds uh, and our temperate woodlands are a very diverse habitat. Um, people think of rainforests as being super diverse and they are, but our temperate woodlands are also very diverse. And there are, san there are many birds that we call obligate woodland birds that only use this habitat type. So this is what we're talking about um, when, we, when we talk about woodlands or forest that function as woodland bird habitat. It's the nice um, fertile soils, um, the forests and the woodlands that grow in those areas. It's not all these wet forests that we see in a lot of national parks along the spur of the Great Dividing Range. This is great forest for, for a number of species, but it's not, uh, it doesn't serve as habitat for our woodland birds. Uh, so the story with woodland birds is a bit, bit of a sad one in terms of habitat. If you can see on that map there, the, the red actually shows uh, vegetation to, to, no, to basically clear land to non, non woody vegetation. So it's pretty clear that in New South Wales and, and Northeast Victoria, there's been a significant loss of uh, these temperate woodland um, habitat. And we're in a, a position now where we've, we've probably lost about 85% of our temperate woodlands. And of that 15% that remains, a lot of it is highly fragmented, which means it doesn't actually serve as woodland bird habitat when it's highly fragmented. So of this suite of uh, woodland birds that ha have declined, the, the most threatened are the Regent honey eater and the swift parrot. Um, they've kind of become the, the iconic birds for woodland bird conservation. And um, both, both spe species are, are listed as critically endangered which is the last rung on the ladder before extinct in the wild. So it's pretty serious. Uh, and there's a, a great photo of a, a Regent honey eater taken in the, the Capity Valley by, by Dean a few years ago. Uh, and so this is a slide that we, we like to show. There's a bit of noise in that data early on perhaps, um, but what that graph is showing is from when we started doing dedicated counts across the range, of the Regent Honey Eater, there were many hundred birds reported to David Gearing back in the mid 90s. Um, and then we sort of marched forward into the 2000s and there was a, 
a, a real population crash around that time. And you can see that the population has kind of leveled out a little bit um, around the 100 to, to 150 birds reported uh, to bird life each year. Uh, and another interesting um, thing about that graph is so the blue the blue bar shows the number of birds reported, but the the orange or the the maroon coloured one uh, shows the number of sites. So back in the 90s, we were getting Regent honey that's reported to us from 200 different places, um, and 200 is probably now the population of the bird. <laughs> so it's it's a pretty pretty stark. Um, reminder of just yeah how serious the, the decline of this bird has been and so far in 2021 we've we've had 14 regent honey it is reported to us it was 13 as of a couple of days ago until ross and liam found a bird lurking in cope state forest which is great news uh, but it's not great news that we we haven't had any real winter flocks reported um, our biggest count, I think, has been four birds at, uh, in Swamp Mahogany or actually in Paperbark in Chain Valley Bay, in the southern shores of Lake Macquarie. Why have Regent honey it has declined so much? Well, the short answer is we don't exactly know. Uh, Ross's research uh, looked into this in great detail and myself, Ross and Liam and Dean often, you know, speculate on, on things and have, you know, have discussions around um, what exactly or why exactly it is that Regent honey eaters have declined um, so seriously when other birds have lost habitat. So many other birds, you know, follow a um, well. They use a similar habitat type to Regent honey eaters, but they haven't they haven't declined to the same extent. Uh, it's most likely something to do with their lifestyle choice, which is to move around a lot. Uh, they're quite fussy. They have their favourite feed trees, similar to koalas. Uh, they won't just set it. They won't just settle in any in any patch of forest. They are looking for the highest quality woodlands with the best available nectar flows. And I guess that's that's a form of specialisation, and and that's to, to be been to their detriment. Uh, but as always, with any with any threatened species, loss of habitat is always the key driver. Uh, and then there are other factors that, that that come into play. But loss of habitat has definitely been the number one um, factor that has contributed to the to, to the um, initial decline of the regents in any case. Uh, so there are some contemporary threats, and uh, you know this is this feeds into a lot of Ross's research. And Ross is Ross can certainly touch on on some of this in detail uh, when he talks. Um, but really, from this point right now, um, it's really the, the critically low population that is the major threat to this bird. Um, it is by nature, it is a bird that, that forms flocks. It's, it's a flocking species, but that just does not happen anymore, unfortunately. Um, and there, there's a, a lack of um, numbers in places where they establish to nest. And so in the few nests that actually uh, occur, they're just sitting ducks, things like parawongs, um, and even you know, gliders, um, brush tail possums, kookaburras, you name it. There's a, a number of, of, of animals that will um, predate a regent honey at a nest. So it's really a numbers game now, and that's what we're trying to address. Uh, so the key breeding locations in the last 15 years have been on the uh, the northwest uh, of of New South Wales and then Bundara Baraba region um, and um, northeast Victoria, uh, where mostly the birds that are breeding there uh, are actually um, part have something to do with the the captive releases that have occurred down in that part of the birds' range. Uh, but you can see those other those other polygons or those other lines pointing to places around the periphery of the Greater Blue Mountains. So, so now. The Greater Blue Mountains really is the stronghold, or the, the edges of the Greater Blue Mountains really is the stronghold for the bird. And the birds now mostly breed in the the Upper Hunter, the Goulburn River of Widden Valley, uh, Burragurung Valley, um, Lower Hunter Valley, and of course the Capity Valley, which is still um, considered the, the the stronghold breeding site for the bird. Um, so yeah, so it's great that people have tuned in to to listen to what's going on with Regent Honey. It is because uh, from from where you guys are situated, because the Capity Valley really is key to the to the viability of this bird. Um, just as an example, we only um, had eight confirmed 
broods uh, last year. I think it was only five or six the year before. Uh, they've had they've had a few um, rough years. 2017 was probably the the last time they had a, a good season. Uh, so fingers crossed for for a good good flowering event this year. And as I mentioned earlier, just um, in, in discussion before, uh, it's really about you know <laughs> are there enough regent honey that is out there to to make make proper use of this 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 apparently good um, blossoming season that's 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 coming up. So of those eight broods there, I think maybe five, yeah, at least five, about five of those were associated with with mistletoe. So during these years when uh, there hasn't been a really great flow of uh, or great supply of, of gum tree blossom, uh, mistletoe, mistletoe has has been has come to the rescue really to to support some of these breeding pairs. And, and one of the nests, well, the only nest that was uh, or, or pair that was found in the Capity last year was was feeding on needle leaf mistletoe along the Capity River. So there has been a recovery team and a recovery plan in place for 27 years now. So people have been working on this bird for some time. Uh, and so it's uh, the bird has continued to decline. So we're in a pretty serious situation. And recently ANU have have taken a whole heap of data information and put it through the, the scientific sausage machine and out the other end um, it comes this thing called a population viability analysis and that's really uh, trying to predict the future of this bird if we do and don't do certain things and not surprisingly um, that concluded that this bird will go extinct if we don't take drastic actions now. Uh, so it's a, uh, yeah, I'm not going to say bleak, but it's a bit of a wake up call. Uh, but out of that, I mean, obviously protecting habitat and trying to restore habitat are key. Uh, but there are a couple of immediate actions that uh, the PVR, PVA identified as, as the most important to, to really ramp up uh, to keep this, to keep the Regent honey eaters going. So one of those, uh, well, there's nest, so there's protection of nests. So we have to do everything we can um, to make sure that any pairs that we find actually succeed uh, because they are having a hard time. Um, so the, the nest successing rate has been, it's, it's much lower than it was uh, in Ross's research. He found it was much lower than it was in the 90s. And even in the 90s, it was much lower than what it should have been for this species to be viable. So we we have to so every nest is is um, particularly important, and the captive releases of the bird to supplement the the population. So I'm just going to talk about those two things, and I'm going to touch on some other uh, recovery actions as well. Um, so the situation's so dire for, with regents that we we brood them in zoos for two reasons. One is to make sure that the species doesn't go extinct full stop. Um, so there are actually birds still in zoos, but uh, the the main reason really is to 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 breed birds to be released to supplement um, the wild population. And those photo those two photos there are taken at the uh, Taronga Zoo aviaries in in Sydney, um, and there's some new aviaries now established out at Western Plains in Dubbo, uh, which is great. It's a, a lot closer to Regent honey eater habitat. In fact, there's been Regent honey eater wild Regent honey eaters found in the in the grounds of the of the zoo is mugger iron bark and that's a photo from the uh, dubbo aviaries so with the captive releases there's been um five major releases in the um in the past uh, 13 years and they've all been in chilton pilot, uh, mount pilot um, national park in victoria the theory there was that we release birds at the edge of their range to try and supplement um, the population down there uh, but recently the recovery team decided to release into the, the core of their range um, in New South Wales. Uh, and so far in Victoria, we have seen some successes in that um, we've achieved the survival rates that, uh, that we, we, we aim to achieve. Um, captive bred birds have successfully bred with wild birds and captive bred birds have bred with each other in the wild. So it seems that it can work. Um, you know, there's always uh, some challenges when you're doing stuff like this. You're playing God, really. 
Um, but last year, so last year was the first uh, attempt at a, at a large scale, large-ish scale release in New South Wales, and that happened in the Lower Hunter Valley, and that was associated with a, a, a major spotted gum flowering event. And of course, it was a, a COVID safe uh, environment when the guys um, attached the radio transmitters um, to the birds, because we do follow um, the birds, or at least a, a proportion of the birds around uh, for some time to see what they do and where they go. And that was a bit of a challenge uh, for the guys that were following the birds, because it was a the, the, the Regent honey it is ranged across a very large area. In Victoria, the National Park in Chilton is more of an island, so they don't have as many options. But in the, the Lower Hunter Hunter, they had lots of options and the birds did did move around. As you can you can see there, the release site's right in the middle where that yellow yellow pin is. Um, and it was uh, it was kind of cool in that back in 2012, there was a flock of 50. Yep, that's right. There were 50 Regent honey eaters at this, this spot. That's only nine years ago. Uh, I wouldn't dream of <laughs> finding re 50 Regent honey eaters in the one place now, which is like, it's only nine years ago. Stuff like that just, just really scares me. Uh, but we actually collected five birds out of that, that flock um, to take to Taronga because Taronga need to supplement their, the, the, the um, genetic pool of birds. They need founding birds um, to, to be fed into the, the captive population to keep that gene pool varied. And so we took five birds from that site and then released 20 um, birds eight years after that. So that's pretty, pretty cool. We, we are looking at where the next release will be. The Capity Valley was considered and the KPD was actually assessed by a professional apiarist. And his conclusion was that it would be too risky to release into the KPD. His opinion was that the yellow box would flower early and of the, of the yellow box that did flower at the right time, so the, the release was planned for late August, early September, that those trees wouldn't produce a lot of nectar. And he also concluded that the mugger ironbarks because a lot of trees had some fruit on them, the trees would actually channel their energy into, into the fruit production and would drop the buds and not flower. So in a way, I kind of hope he's wrong. <laughs> I mean, we, we had to make a decision on the release, so we decided not to do a release in the Capity, unfortunately. Uh, and we're still um, confirming where, the, where the, re the release will be, but the lower hunter is looking um, good again. Uh, so that's... Bad news, I guess, for for people in the valley, because yeah, we were all very excited about doing a, a release there, but we we had to listen to the advice of of the professional apiarist. Um, and so, uh, in recent times, the the technology has has been such that we can now uh, put satellite transmitters on on a songbird as small as a Regent honey. This has been done on shorebirds and seabirds. So this is different to a radio tracked bird. This is a satellite tracked bird. So rather than having to walk around the bush with a, an antenna looking for your bird, you can watch your bird from home on, on, a, on a laptop. That's really exciting. Uh, we haven't uh, actually been able to, to fit one yet. Dean's been perfecting the design and he's recently done some uh, some trials at, uh, at Taronga, Zoo, Taronga Zoo. Uh, you can see that bird on the right there. That's wearing one of the satellite, or it's a dummy satellite um, transmitter um, that Dean's fitted, and it's been a success. So the birds have been getting around quite nicely in the in the Wallamai Avery, and so that's exciting news. That uh, so with the release, we will put some some transmitters on these birds, maybe two or three, maybe four um, satellite transmitters to see where the um, release birds go when, when when that happens. But also, if if we're able to catch a, a wild bird, we'll be able to watch where they go um, at any time, but we, st we still don't really know where they go after they breed. So this will go a long way to answering some of these questions. Uh, I'm not watching how I'm going for time, but um, feel free to, Joe, if I'm, if I'm getting close, maybe ring a bell. Uh, so I'll give you yeah. <clears throat> I'll give you five minutes left. Five, all right, cool. Got about so, five minutes, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. I'll 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 move through quickly then. So mistletoe, that's a photo there of some little lorikeets feeding on mistletoe blossom, just to illustrate that this is uh, a great nectar food source. And Regent honey eaters love mistletoe. Um, 
but not only for nectar, um, Regent honey eaters will will nest um, on the strength of mistletoe blossom and actually nest inside uh, mistletoe clumps. So mistletoe was a really important habitat resource for Regent honey eaters. Thing about mistletoe is it does not survive fire, and that that red polygon there is some major fires that have gone through the Lower Hunter woodlands, and you can see the yellow dots. Um, they're Regent honey eater records, so it's taken out most of almost all of the the breeding habitat there and it's taken out the mistletoe. Uh, so we have been, that's just a photo of a bird sitting in a nest in 2018. So we're getting active and getting ahead of the game of the mistletoe bird by actually uh, planting the fruits ourselves, not waiting for them to, to deposit the fruits on, on branches. So that's been happening in spotted gum trees down in the lower hunter. Um, and we've managed to get about a thousand seeds planted using arborists to get the get the seeds right up into the tops of trees. We can walk around and just wipe seeds onto branches ourselves, but a regent honey eater is not going to use a mistletoe clump that's a couple of metres from the ground. They need to go in, into the canopy. And that's been a, a great collaboration with the, the local Aboriginal Land Council down here. Um, mistletoe also does not survive drought very well. And along the Capity River where that photo was taken, in a section of river which was at one time the nursery of the regent honey eater, um, you know, where David Gearing would find many, many pairs nesting. Um, every single clump of mistletoe died during the dry. Every single clump. We couldn't find one live mistletoe clump. Uh, so similar to the lower hunter, we're getting ahead of the game of the mistletoe bird and collecting fruit ourselves and sending an arborist up into the, the river oaks to plant mistletoe, which is fantastic. We managed to get a thousand of those planted this year too. Uh, I, ne I mentioned nest protection and, uh, and other nest interventions as, as priorities for Regents and uh, we work closely with, with Ross and Liam on this and just a couple of examples there of putting of trunk collars on, on, the, um, on trees where we've, or even nearby trees to where there's a Regent honey at a nest because gliders can obviously get across from, from tree to tree. Um, and we also are fitting cameras and things to actually watch what's going on. And we actually, I think in that very tree there, a couple of seasons ago, we saw a brush tail possum um, predate a, a regent honey at a nest. Okay, so I'm just going to finish off talking about the noisy miner problem. And I know that Ross's, Ross's talk focuses on noisy miners as well. Uh, so I won't talk about, I won't introduce the bird. I don't think I really need to go into any detail about how to identify or distinguish a noisy miner from a common miner. Uh, the, the noisy miner, importantly, is a native. It's a, a species of honey eater. The common miner or the Indian miner is a, it's a type of starling and it's an introduced species. Um, but really, noisy miners are a much bigger problem for our woodland birds than Indian miners. They don't. Indian miners or common miners don't really cross paths with our, our woodland birds. Um, so what noisy miners do is they they exclude um, birds from from patches of woodland that have been fragmented. So it, in a way, you can, it, the way of thinking about it is uh, over the last 200 odd years, we've gone through and we've we've created the perfect environment for noisy miners to flourish, and flourish they have. So we are now in a situation where noisy miners have become overabundant, and they are a major problem for a number of birds. But they are now uh, overabundant at places where Regent honey eaters uh, used to breed and are still trying to breed. And they are enshrined in legislation as a key threatening process uh, to uh, woodland birds. So this stuff isn't just hearsay, it's actually enshrined in, in, in legislation. What do we do about it? Broadly, it's a very difficult problem, um, but for Regent honey eater recovery, um, what we've been focusing on is removing noisy miners um, from Regent honey eater uh, breeding areas. And we get asked bef before anyone asks the question, yes, they, are, they we, we shoot them, that's how, how it's done. It's actually very effective. Uh, and we do proactive and reactive control. So proactive is uh, getting, is doing a, a cull ahead of a breeding season. Reactive is doing a cull of noisy miners um, when uh, when a, a regent honey eater nest is found. And back in 2017, uh, where that photo that Joe was showing, or, or Ev, the, the photo of the, um, the parent feeding the, the chick uh, was taken at this spot here. So Ross found some regent honey eaters trying to establish to, 
to build nests, but there were noisy miners uh, present. He got on the phone to us and said, guys, we've got a noisy miner problem. So we um, we got our guy out to go out, remove the miners, and that turned out to be, yeah, there's that photo there, turned out to be the most successful um, site for, for, for Regents that season. Whether or not that was to do with the removal of miners, we don't know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it, it, it contributed. Uh, so we've also done this in the Lower Hunter. I won't talk about that. There's the Widden Valley, which Ross is going to talk about. So I'm going to finish on this. So we are, we are, we have uh, embarked on a very ambitious program of trying to stop. So as we're as we're removing noisy miners from the Regent Honeyeater breeding sites, uh, we've also thought about how we can actually remove noisy miners from across the valley, uh, full stop. Um, because they are inter intersecting with a lot of woodland birds that are in, in heavy decline. And the Cape Valley really is where it's at for, 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 for many species. Um, it's so much easier to see things like hooded robins in the Cape than other, other places. So what we're attempting to do, what well, is a bit of an experiment, is to remove the miners at the, at the top of the valley um, there around Mount Marsden, because presumably that's the way that they, they, they get into the, into the valley. Um, and what do what can landholders do? Um, well, basically, um, you know, where there's bigger buffers of vegetated areas, that makes life hard for the miners to to get back into areas where they've been removed from. And and also, we just need to avoid more clearing and underscrubbing. If it's tr if trees are great, but if it's trees and, and grass, that's that's going to be perfect noisy miner habitat. So whenever there's revegetation efforts done. We like to see a, a wide range of shrubs and and other low growing plants because they they generally like noisy miners do not like a, a dense understory. So we need to think uh, into the future about how we exclude noisy miners once we've removed them from from important region honey eater sites. So sorry to rush through those last last uh, few slides, but um, yeah. That's brilliant. Any questions brilliant. at the at the end? But I think somebody did ask a question in the chat there. Yeah, that's yeah. right, Mick. They did. Someone, Wendy, actually yeah. um, did ask a question. But what we might do is we might go straight to Ross. And Wendy, I'm not palming your question off. We will certainly get to that in the Q&A after Ross's talk, if that's OK with everyone. So, um, Ross, are you ready to? I am here. Yep. Oh, hi. Uh, two <laughs> seconds. I've just got to figure out how to... Uh... Share my screen again. Sure, it's different to Zoom, Ross. Yeah, yeah. Any tips, <laughs> anyone? A bit tricky. Uh, there's a just next to the leave button. Don't click the leave button, but just next to it, there's a little square with a arrow pointing up. To oh, yeah, like cool. that, and yeah, then yeah. find your window that yeah, you want you, to share with us. You've got to navigate to your to your file. Yeah. Uh, talk. yeah. Two seconds. No Thanks, Mick. That was really interesting. Great, great insight. Yeah, it's it's um like it's a bit of a worry that we've only had fourteen birds this year. It's um yeah, like like I said, it's going to be a great season for eucalypt blossom. And I, you know, d despite what the uh, the the apiarist said about the capity, uh, there still will be plenty of nectar flow in the valley. Yeah. And I guess I guess the, what we decided was that naive birds that are bred in captivity, they probably wouldn't be able to find their way around and find those good nectar flows. But wild regent honey eaters are very good at that, so they will they will find the good nectar flows. The worry is just how, how many birds are alive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's only fourteen that have been reported sightings. Is that? Correct. That's or no. You... So that's that's fourteen individuals from I think nine sightings. So a few of those sightings have been more than one bird. Okay. Yeah, but but yeah, four is the biggest. <laughs> All right, folks. Can can you see my screen? Yep, we can. Sweet. I've got a warning at the top that says PowerPoint isn't or isn't visible to people who joined after the meeting was full. Does that mean anything? Does anyone Sorry, out there can't see this? Say that again, Ross. Um, there's a warning that says PowerPoint or app sharing isn't visible to people who joined after the meeting was full. Oh, but if um, everyone can see, if I believe so. Can... But 
questions. Anyone that can't see Ross's screen, let me know. Um, but I will I don't think the meeting is. Cool. All right. Well, hopefully this goes smoothly. Um, thanks everyone for inviting me to talk this morning. Um, my name is Ross. I'm a postdoc at the ANU. Uh, as Mick mentioned, we work very closely with BirdLife and LLS and Taronga Zoo. Um, and I guess the main focus of our research is really to implement um, um, a more intensive and extensive monitoring program to find out things about region honey eaters that we can use to gain evidence to help inform their conservation, primarily in the wild. We do do a little bit of work with the captive birds. Um, but yeah, 90% 90, 90 of our research focuses on, on, on the wild population. So um, this talk is mostly going to be about noisy miners, um, almost exclusively actually, so I'll get cracking. Um, Mick's already mentioned, um, I'm sure many of the uh, people watching this will be very familiar with this landscape. This is obviously the Cape Tea Valley, but it just gives a perfect example of the sorts of habitats that, that noisy miners really like. They love edges. Um, so, you know, the bot bottoms of slopes where there's sort of sparsely populated trees and along the creek lines here um, and fields with paddock trees is, is prime noisy mine habitat. But for species like region honey eaters, this is a, this is a problem because, um, you know, these fertile soils in the river flats are exactly where region honey eaters are trying to nest. So, um, you know, throughout the range of the region honey eaters now, there's, there's almost you know everywhere that region honey eaters could could breed is also viable habitat for, for noisy miners so um, we need to try and do something about managing these impacts um yeah mix mentioned this again already but there's there's heaps of science it's basically undisputable now that, that region honey eaters have uh, sorry noisy miners have a major impact on on the whole suite of threatened woodland birds so um, noisy miners are about 60 grams um, body mass. So any bird, basically any bird that's smaller than 60 grams, um, can have trouble from noisy miners if uh, noisy miners are present at a certain density. So the the, the stats show that this density is a, is around less than one bird per hectare. So what you see on this figure here is that as noisy miner density increases you find a, a decrease in the abundance of, and, and species richness of, of, of small woodland birds. And that's pretty much across all um, traits. So ground foragers, um, canopy dwellers, insectivores and nectarivores. Um, so what we're trying to do really is use this threshold of about 0.6 noisy miners per hectare um, as our target kind of noisy miner density. Ideally, we want to eliminate noisy miners from these really important areas. But getting below the 0.6 is, is the key. So um, again, here is an example of even if noisy miners are present at really low density, they can still have problems. So um, this is a this is actually a dummy nest. Uh, it's, a, it's a quail egg experiment that I undertook in KT National Park in 2016. But it shows that you know even even if you have one or two noisy miners, they still pose a threat to, to, to region honey eaters. Um, through nest destruction, and I've actually witnessed um, two region honey to nests get torn apart by by noisy miners in the KFT Valley over the past uh, past few years. Um, yeah, so so all this all this science has basically come to the point now where um, uh, the the threat from noisy miners in, is recognised in federal federal biodiversity legislation. Um, and, and this enables, under license, it enables um, noisy miners to be culled in, t in terms of you know, um, conservation action. However, one of the problems we, we find is that it's, it's not always as simple a case of going in you know, with, a, with a shooter and removing the birds, because in many areas, what, we, what the research has found is that um, noisy miners can recolonize really quickly. So, so Richard Beggs uh, was a colleague of mine, PhD student in the Fender School at ANU, and his work in the southwest slopes around Gundagai, he found that you know, even if you, if you remove noisy miners from these small patches in this kind of you know, agricultural landscape, you know, they'd be, they would be back within, within a few days or, or hours. And Galen Davitt, who's working up in the Northern Tablelands in travel and stock reserves, found something very similar um, in that you, know, you, you would go in and 
remove all the noisy miners and within two or three days they'd be recolonized in these, these places. So the challenge really is to find areas where we can go in and be confident that if we remove noisy miners, they will stay away. So what we're trying to do with our research at ANU is, is basically find out whether you can reduce noisy miner abundance through noisy miner culling. Um, does this help reduce the presence of noisy miners around Regent Huntington nests? Does it also in, it lead to an increase in just general songbird abundance? And the, uh, importantly as well is how long can, can these management actions keep noisy miners away in these really critical breeding areas? So this is a, this is a spot on the Golden River in the upper Hunter Valley. Um, we started monitoring this site in 2016 and when we set up sites, there was actually four pairs of region honeyters breeding along this stretch of the river. Um, it's a biodiversity offset property owned by um, Yanko, one of the coal mines in the um, Upper Hunter. Um, and so they were absolutely overjoyed when we found Regent Honeyters nesting there because you know, they spend millions of dollars acquiring and managing these properties and almost none of them ever have any region. So for them to, to, to own a property and manage it for conservation um, and actually have tangible outcomes was really great. And they were keen to do as much as they could to try and kind of improve the the, um, the conservation value of this property for region hunters. So we've we've developed this really um, productive um, collaboration between um, ANU and, and Yankol over the last five years to manage noisy miners in this property. Um, so what we did, um, if you can look at this map on the bottom right hand side, we set up a bunch of monitoring sites. So every one of these little dots on this, on this map here is, is, a, is a small bird survey location, five minutes, 50, um, 50 meters hectare point count. And in the top left here is the, the count of noisy miners before we, before we did any removal of noisy miners. And the darker the shade of the dots is the higher the number of noisy miners there were at that site. And this currently corresponds to this, this map in the bottom left. And so what you can see is that, is that noisy miners, they weren't hyper abundant, but you know, there, was good, there were sites where we were finding six, seven birds um, per survey before we did the, the first removal. Um, we went and resurveyed the sites two days after um, you know, the pest management consultants had spent um, a week removing the noisy miners from, the, from this site. Um, and I should mention here as well is that anywhere within this dotted dotted line, the dotted square here is a control area. So we didn't remove noisy miners. So basically what we're doing is comparing the abundance of noisy miners in, in the treatment area outside of the dotted square to the, the abundance of noisy miners inside the dotted square and how that changes before and after the cull. Um, and what you can see, you know, from these time periods after the coal, so post one year in 2017, post 15 months, is that we find a consistent decrease in the number of noisy miners that occupy the control area, uh, the treatment area. And what that's enables us to do is actually increase the size of, of the treatment area of this property. And so in uh, 2018, we were able to remove noisy miners from what was the treatment area. Um, so if you look at the centre right, you see that after that coal, we managed to remove almost all the noisy miners from there, and we've gone in again. Um, and this new control area we set up in the bottom right panel here, we've we've now removed noisy miners from that area as well. So we're hopeful um, that within about two weeks' time, almost the entire property will be basically free of noisy miners, um, which is a fantastic result because this is one of the most important breeding areas for region honeyeaters um, outside of the Cape Sea Valley. This plot just shows that there was a kind of you know significant decrease in noisy miners relative to the control area. So the first um, two two bars here show that before the coal, the abundance of noisy miners was very similar in the treatment and the control areas, but after the coal, um, noisy miner abundance was significantly lower in in the treatment area. So the blue bars relative to the control area, where noisy miners abundance stayed the same for the three months after the coal. In terms of region honeyeaters, in 2017, we had up to 18 birds occupying this, this treatment area um, and six nests fledged six young. 
Um, there were no birds present in 2018, mostly because the yellow box wasn't flowering, but we did have 20 painted and honey eaters breeding in the area. Um, and the regions turned up again in 2019, um, where we had two, two nests um, and 30 painted honey eaters. We also had a bird there last year, but didn't, didn't nest, unfortunately, because the conditions weren't good. Um, but the main, the main take home message from this Golden River study is that if you do it in the right location, noisy minor management can be a really effective strategy. I'll skip over this briefly, but it just shows that um, the broader songbird community responds really positively to noisy minor, minor, noisy minor management as well. So um, each of these little little marks here, the little pins, um, show the, the timing of, of, a, of a cull, and you can see that songbird abundance increases pretty much after every cull, up to about 18 months after the after the first cull. Um, this arrow here shows the location of the Golden River study site in the context of the, of the Greater Blue Mountains. And what you can see um, is that you know, the, the, the surrounding area is really heavily forested. And so what we think is that, that, that we picked out this little island of suitable habitat for noisy miners in a matrix of inhospitable habitat. So the idea was that if we move them from there, they wouldn't recolonize quickly because there simply weren't many birds in the surrounding area. So if we take that theory, we can identify heaps of other places in the Great Blue Mountains where we think we could have similar results to what we had in the Golden River. So we've got Katy National Park here. We've got the Wind Valley here. We've got other sections of the Golden River up north, Katy Valley in general. And so what we've done now is basically try to replicate the, the Golden River management strategy in other areas. Um, and importantly, what we've done now is, is, is choose areas that kind of span a gradient of, of habitat clearing. So we've got sites down in Cowra, um, where you know, the habitat's really, really open, and we might expect noisy miners to recolonize quickly. We've got sites up in the Northern Tablelands near Baraba, where it's kind of intermediate. Um, and then we've got these sites in the Blue Mountains, particularly in the Wind Valley, um, and up on the Golden River, where we, we would predict that um, noisy minor management will be most effective in the long term. So this graph here is, is basically how we've repeated the Golden River study. So the original was Golden River 1 here, um, second from the end on the, on, the, on the bottom row. And each of these is a site where we, the first bar is, is the pre-cull noisy minor abundance, and the consecutive bars are two days, one month, and three months after the cull. Some of the, some of the sites here didn't have a one-month cull. If there's, if there's only three bars, it's because we only did the post two days and the post three months. And the red line going through this axis here equates to this kind of threshold density of noisy miners of 0.6 birds per hectare, which is what we're trying to achieve. So anywhere below or very close to that red line, we can confidently say that noisy miners won't be having an impact in any of these sites. So I guess the most interesting thing from, from, from this plot is to see how variable the, the outcomes of, of noisy minor culls are in, in different areas. So, you know, for example, um, in Kuna on Kuna TSR and the Wind Valley and most of the Golden River sites, we found that a single cull you know, really suppressed noisy miners for a, for a good length of time, tip, you know, almost the entire breeding season and longer. But in other areas around the edges of Chiltern National Park, you know, in IMR and in Mount Mars and in the north of the KT, we find that even though noisy miner abundance generally declined, it didn't decline as much as it did in other areas. And so what we're trying to do now is, is kind of meta-analyze all the data from these different polls to pick out the important factors in determining where noisy minor management can be successful and where you know where on our money might be better spent on habitat restoration um yeah um because the, one of the problems we've had in general with noisy minor culling over the last five years is that you know people use different strategy strategies in different areas and people use different monitoring designs um, and some of the culls are unofficial so Landowners will will do a sort of you know, sneaky cull in their backyard, um, 
And trying to kind of synthesize all that data is very challenging when people use different methodologies. So what we're trying to do here is use this consistent methodology in different areas, and that will allow us to you know, identify these, these broad patterns of where noisy management is a, is a good thing and, and where it doesn't seem to be working so much. But overall, um, you can see that even, even a single week's worth of culling in these areas has an impact on, on region, uh, noisy minor numbers. Um, just briefly before I go on, the Wind Valley is a really cool one as well. Um, we've been focusing our efforts there in the last uh, couple of years. We had birds nesting there in 2018, I think it was the first year. Um, so we've been working with the landowners down there to to remove noisy miners. We've now removed nearly 2,000, actually over 2,000 noisy miners from the bottom of the Wind Valley. Um, and that's been really successful. Um, and we've had region hunters nest there last year. We had two nests that fledged five young. So, and we've recently gone in mixed span in the treatment area. So what we can do again, similar to the Golden River, is find these areas where noisy miners stay away for, you know, a year or more, which enables us to go back in and, and increase the size of these areas. Um, and this is perfect for region honeyters because, you know, there's big areas out there like the Widden Valley, for example, where the habitat is present, but the birds simply can't access it because they'll get chased off by noisy miners. So this is, in effect, a quick fix for habitat restoration because we're, we're allowing the birds to access breeding habitat that they otherwise wouldn't access if it was full of noisy miners. Um, this is the same graph, but looking at the response of songbirds. So you can see in general, we find this increase in songbird abundance um, after the cull. So from the second second bar in all of these figures, it's not always consistent. So for example, we found some drops in the Wind Valley in Mount Marsden. Um, um, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but um, someone's yeah. just commented that um, if you can use the cursor to point out what you're talking about. Can I? Really help can people see my cursor? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, no, we can't. That's okay, sorry, carry on. Oh, all good, I'm nearly done anyway. The broad conclusions are that noisy minor culling can be effective in reducing noisy minor abundance if you do it in the right place at the right time. Um, and what we think is the key is, is doing it in these areas where noisy miners are sparse in the surrounding area. Um, we also need to do it where these populations of threatened woodland birds are still persisting. So in a sense, what we're trying to do is identify the front line of kind of the, the battle between noisy miners and songbirds and go in and tip the balance back in the favour of the songbirds. Um, there are lots of trade-offs to consider. Obviously, noisy miners are a native species, so there's ethical um, considerations in that, and that also feeds into where we do these management strategies. We need to do it in areas where the benefit's gonna be high, the ethical costs are gonna be low, the financial costs are gonna be low, and we're actually gonna see tangible responses from the songbirds. So, I'll just finish up by saying, yeah, our work is through the ANU is kind of tongue in cheek, is done by the Difficult Bird Research Group. So me and Liam are part of that group. Um, and if, you, if anyone's interested in reading our research, there's a, a tab at the top here that's called Research Output, where you can read all of our papers. You can access them for free through this website, including all our work on noisy miners and region honeyters. So there's no pay, pay, uh, paywalls involved in that. So I just thank LLS for funding some of this work. And I thank BirdLife for their collaboration. Um, and there's yeah, heaps of other people that helped us along the way. So keen to hear some questions. Thank you so much, Ross. That was so interesting. Um, really appreciate the, the other, uh, I guess, angle to the, the conservation of the regional honey eaters. I love the, I love the title "Difficult Bird Research Group" as well. <laughs> um, we have a few questions actually for both of you, uh, Ross and Mick. Um, I might just start at the top with Wendy's, if that's okay, because um, we've got maybe about about 10 minutes for questions. So we'll go through the ones that are written in the chat and then we'll open up the floor to everyone who wants to ask their questions too. So Wendy, Mick, um, Wendy asks you, is mistletoe perennial or deciduous? There were good clumps in the iron barks uh, near her house, but some of them have lost their leaves. They're not deciduous. And when, yeah, I mean, mistletoe, 
plants do naturally lose leaves often, uh, and that's why you actually get a, a great humus layer on the floor beneath the mistletoe clump, uh, which provides great habitat for bird food, spiders and insects. Um, but when a mistletoe clump loses all its leaves, it's it's in strife. So that's what that means. Um, and that will happen um, in in very dry periods. So when a mistletoe clump loses its leaves, it's not it's not good. Right, interesting. Okay, thank you, Mick. I, mean, I could talk more, um, but there's a few questions. That... <laughs> Sorry, Mick. Um, there is, if you wanted to add anything, go ahead. But yeah, there are a few questions. Um, Kay has, uh, has said, it'd be helpful to know more about the preferred understory habitat that's not conducive for noisy, noisy miners, and also what flowering grevilleas aren't a good idea. Well, basically the large showy grevilleas aren't a good idea, like your Robin Gordons and things like that. If you plant small flowering grevilleas, um, noisy miners can't get into those those flowers, but things like, you know, scarlet honey, there's brown honey, there's spinebills can. So if you are going to plant grevilleas, go for smaller flowered ones. Um, but about, I mean, the question, a related question about the understory um, in planting, that's, it's, it's a really difficult one because you can't actually really restore an understory or lower strata in a, in a forest. It takes, it takes 100 years really so um yeah it's 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 a hard one to choose the right species because there's always a balance i mean callistamines do well uh, but callistamines will will also attract uh, miners but yeah uh, i haven't been, actually been involved myself i mean ross do, do you do you have any ideas about Shrubs. Um, shrub species. I mean, I guess the the main point is, if even if you get noisy miners, if you've got any habitat restoration, it's going to provide some benefits. You know, if it attracts yeah. noisy miners, it's also going to have have a few woodland birds. Um, and um, there is research. So Brad Law did some some work in um, I think it was in State Forest, looking at sort of long term trends in 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 woodland bird numbers after big. Um, habitat restoration and that wasn't necessarily to do with the understory but you, sh you show that you get this kind of you get a peak in noisy minor numbers after say maybe 10 to 15 years but then after a while they'll drop off as the as the understory kind of um you know recovers naturally so i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't say don't plant shrubs or any particular species of shrubs through a fear of attracting noisy miners because even if you get noisy miners you'll still get a few other woodland birds in there as well Anything's better than nothing. Yeah, that's right. And we, we've actually done some surveys that the 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 tree plantings that have that have happened in the valley. Uh, so there there is there is some some data, and I mean, you know, it really only show the obvious stuff. That don't plant rows of trees. You know, like it's more of a an, an area thing, um, and diversity is is key as well in what you're planting. Okay. Thank you, Mick and Ross. Um, I hope that answers your question. And I think that probably goes some way to answer Colin and Layla's question about which native um, shrubs are beneficial and not harmful in the Glen Davis area. But is there anything you wish to add, either of you, or should we move on to the next question? Yeah, m maybe move on from that. I mean, we can we sure. can certainly share some information after the yeah after the workshop. yeah sure definitely okay thanks Mick. Okay, so the next question is from Michael. Uh, the Burragarang Valley, uh, Valley was listed as a key breeding site on an early slide. Would the proposed raising of the Warragamba Dam wall have an adverse impact on the region honey to habitat in that area? Cheers, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mick. <laughs> well, well, the, the answer is yes, <laughs> most definitely. And there is a campaign. Uh, I don't, so, uh, Ross, do you want to talk to it? Like, um, I look, it's a touchy subject for me. So, um, full yeah. disclosure, I was actually contracted to do the surveys and found the birds down there. So, I have to be very careful about what I say. Um, oh, I'm, however, I'm... you could imagine that all I will say is that where we were surveying for region honeyeaters in the Barra Grand Valley, it was in the area that would potentially be impacted by any dam raising um, proposals. So, um, I'll leave you to to make your own mind up about that. 
Yeah, so I, I mean, the, the short answer is is yes. And I wrote a short piece for the recent Australian BirdLife, the BirdLife Australia magazine, um, about about this issue. Um, the fact that raising the dam wall uh, 17 metres is, will see the loss of a, a large area of habitat that Regent honey eaters have bred in 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 contemporary times. It's it's absolutely ridiculous to think that uh, for a species that is on the brink of extinction that that they would give the go ahead to inundating breeding one of the most important breeding sites um, in recent times. So yeah, it's 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 a definite yes. And if you if you Google um, Warragamba Dam Regent honey eater or or Google give a dam give a dam is the name of the campaign um, that is happening and people like Bob Davis, um, Bob Carr has come out in the last week um, in support of that campaign. So yeah, there is, a, there is a lot of activity in that space. It's not just about Regent Honey Eaters, it's also about cultural, culturally significant sites and other threatened trees and plants and, and fauna. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can do a lot of reading on it. There's, there's plenty of stuff out there. I'll just add to that as well, Mick, is that one of the things with the Barragang Valley is a lot, you know, probably over 80, 70 percent of it is inaccessible. So um, in terms of how well we can survey the Barragang Valley relative to other areas like the KT is 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 much more challenging. So there may well be more birds out there yep. that we don't know about simply because yep. we haven't been able to look. For sure. We have lots more questions. They're coming in. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, so, uh, do region honey eaters have a preferred altitude for their habitat? Well, I'm not sure if there's a preferred altitude. It depends on the biogeography of of the area. They they can occur at six or seven hundred meters if it's if it's the right habitat, but they generally don't occur on steep slopes so it's more topographical than altitudinal i, I guess uh, but generally speaking they they are probably at lower altitudes um, east of the east of the great divide um, they certainly occur almost down to sea level in the swamp mahogany dominated forests um, and then on the western slopes i guess you're already going to be 300 meters above sea level um, anyway, but I, I, maybe if the question was asking, you know, do they occur at high altitudes? They they generally don't. They will use occasionally use some of the um, higher country um, in the Blue Mountains. Uh, in fact, once we put a satellite tra transmitter on birds, we we might find out that they use that higher country more often than we think. Um, yeah, so that's I don't know, Ross, if you want to add to that. <laughs> Um, all I would say in terms of breeding habitat is that they probably definitely prefer the bottoms of river valleys. You know, they they very rarely nest anywhere far, you know, more than a couple of hundred meters from standing water. So they the the altitude per se, as Mick says, probably doesn't really matter that much because you know up in the northern tablelands you they'll occur at 800, 900 plus meters. But if you took a cross section of a valley, regardless of what um, the altitude of that valley was. The first place I'd be looking for regions during the breeding season would be at the very bottom of that valley. Right, interesting. Thank you. Um, we have perhaps two associated questions uh, from Penny. First of all, saying, are we allowed to control noisy miners legally? And Tony also asks, given their aggressive behaviour, would it be possible to design a trap for the noisy miners? Um, whether you wanted to, so. Um, well, I'll, 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 the, the, I'll answer the first one because there are there are native species that are protected. So you actually need a, a, a special license to be able to remove noisy miners. Um, technically speaking. Um, so the sorry, what was the, the second question of? Yeah, the second question was from Tony um, and related as given their aggressive behaviour, would it be possible to design a oh, trap? trap. Yeah. yeah. Are you aware of traps, Ross? Um, there's definitely traps for, for common miners. But right. I think the problem with noisy miners is that they're, they're actually really smart birds. Um, they, they'll they learn. So what, some of the first removal experiments, actually, Carla Katz rule up in Queensland 
Um, she first tried to just mist net the birds and move them out of areas that she was doing these experimental studies. And she found that, you know, once you caught two or three birds, you basically you had no chance of catching the, the rest because they clocked on so quickly to what was going on. So, um, and we even find that with, with shooting them, you know, like you go in and do one round of shooting and you go back and the next time the birds are absolutely terrified of people. So um, trapping is probably in terms of, removing large numbers of birds from an area quickly trapping is probably not really a cost-effective method um just quickly on on the licensing as well so you need a section 121 license which is issued by national parks and wildlife service um it's the same permit you can use to control things like kangaroos on your property so you can get one um i think you just need to put forward a, a strong case if it was like a um if it was something you wanted to do in your own yard yeah, for example, you'd have to, yeah, put forward a strong argument for, for it to be um, approved. But it is possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have probably three more questions and then we'll go to a break, if that's okay with um, everyone. So Tony asks, is there a specific, specific mistletoe that they use? Um. Yeah, so the three main species of mistletoes that they use. So in the Capity Valley, the, there's two species. There's the noodle leaf mistletoe, which, which occurs only on the on the river oaks, the she oaks. Uh, and that's, as I mentioned, an important breeding resource because it occurs along the river. Uh, the other mistletoe that Regent Honey is used in the Capity is the box mistletoe, which occurs in a range of of eucalypts, um, obviously box trees, um, yellow box, white box, um, it'll occur in iron barks as well. It occurs in, in muggers. Uh, it flowers in sort of late summer, so it's more of a, it would be more of a post breeding uh, resource. Uh, whereas the, the noodle leaf flowers in spring, so that's that sort of coincides with the region's um, breeding season. Uh, and in the lower hunter, or well, I guess. The same applies for the Cape Dee in the Goulburn River. It's 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 the, the same again, and and places like the Widden, Widden Valley, uh, Burragarang Valley has has those two species as well. Uh, but in the Lower Hunter, um, that's more of a specialised site for their breeding because when they breed in the Lower Hunter, it's usually associated with the broadleaf ironbark and a thing called a long flowered mistletoe. And that long flowered mistletoe only grows on the spotted gums. It grows on a few uh, narrow leaved apple trees, but they're generally not in the region honey their habitat. So it occurs in, in spotted gums um, down here. So having said that, I'm sure that Regent honey eaters wouldn't pass up um, nectar from a different species of mistletoe outside of those three main ones uh, if it was on, on offer. Uh, but they are the main the main three species. OK, thank you, Mick. Um, I might make an executive decision because I actually think it's really important for everyone to stretch their legs and have a break. Um, we will definitely get to those questions, but we might get to those questions in the longer Q&A after the break just to keep us on schedule, if that's OK. So I've definitely got them pinned and we will come back to them, but I think it's important for everyone to stretch their legs and have a break. <laughs> so, 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 Joe, just I'm just letting people know that I'm sure. I'm happy to hang around like after the end, like just and just answer questions till whenever. I'm I've got I've got a leave pass, so I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Yeah. There you go. A whole afternoon with Mick. <laughs> Thanks if, if very much, Mick. That's good to know. Um, so if everyone, I would say we have not that long really maybe five or ten minutes just to stretch your legs and uh, have a break make a cup of tea and come back at 11 o'clock if that's okay we're running about five minutes behind so yeah stretch stretch your legs and have a break thanks very much everyone
everyone's coming back. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. I think we have the majority of people back, so we might get started. So we've got a bit of a change up to the format. So we're lucky enough to have also have Monique here. So Dr. Malik Sluice, I hope I've said that correctly, Monique. Um, and she works at Taronga Zoo and she's um, been kind enough to share us some videos of the birds, uh, the beautiful Regent Honey Eater. Um, and so we're going to be playing two short videos from Taronga TV and then Monique is happy to take any questions about uh, the captive breeding program at Taronga. So um, let me know if you can't hear the video um, but hopefully I've shared my audio so it should play pretty smoothly. So here we go. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a bird keeper and the species coordinator of the Regent Honey Eater here at Taronga Zoo. This year has been an exciting year for the, the breeding of the Regent Honey Eater. We've expanded the program out to Taronga Western Plains Zoo and they've had a very successful year with all six of their pairs producing chicks and they have around 30 chicks at the moment. Here at Taronga we had seven pairs of which two were wild birds that bred for the first time. So we've got about 21 chicks right now and we've got birds down um, on their third lot of eggs so big things to come. We've been involved in the Regent Honey Eater Recovery Program since 1995. So over the last 25 years, we've bred roughly 470 birds here at Taronga and released 280 of those back to the wild. So after the drought and fires of last year, we had to postpone last year's release um, and we were able to release those birds this year in June. We released 20 birds into the Upper Hunter Valley. The birds were transported up to the Hunter, had a couple of days uh, rest in special release tents um, and then they were released in two batches of, of 10 birds. 14 of those birds had radio transmitters on them so that they were able to be monitored in the wild um, and there were teams um, out there in the wild monitoring those birds over the next 10 weeks to see how they integrated into the wild population. So they were seen interacting with wild birds, foraging and showing great wild behaviours. The breeding program has this year been expanded out to Taronga Western Plains Zoo and um, they've had great success. So Cara's going to tell you a bit about that. So over to you Cara. Thank you team. Here at Taronga Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo, we have started our first breeding season for the Regent Honey Eater Recovery Program. We started this season with six pairs of Regent Honey Eaters and I'm happy to say that we have had a 100% success rate so far with all six of our pairs producing chicks and they've been into their second and even third clutches and to date we've hatched 30 chicks and this number is still increasing as the breeding season has not stopped yet. So unfortunately the Regent Honey Eater is listed as a critically endangered bird with less than 400 in the wild. So here at Taronga Western Plains as well as Taronga Zoo in Sydney, our Regent Honey Eater recovery program is extremely important for the survival of this species in the wild. So to have this great result in our first breeding season out here in Dubbo is extremely important for the insurance population of the Regent Honey Eater so we can help to bolster that population and increase those numbers. And although we have 30 chicks already, which is a massive achievement, the season isn't over yet and we do hope to see a few more before the end of January. Hi, I'm Cara and I'm one of the Regent Honey Eater Keepers here at Taronga Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo. And today I'm here to give you a recap on our very first breeding season here. So we started the season, so our first Regent Honey Eater breeding season was back in 2020 and we actually had our first pairs pair together in June and we actually had our first chick hatch on the 4th of August and we also had our last chick hatch on the 30th of November. So out of these six breeding pairs that we started our season with, we are very happy to say that we had a 100% success rate and all six pairs had produced quite a few chicks. So at the end of it, we actually got 33 chicks out of our first breeding season out here at Taronga Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo. 
Now at around 35 days of age, the Regent honey, the juveniles are big enough to be taken away from their parents, which is completely natural. In the wild, they will disperse quite naturally and move on to another area. So here in our zoo-based program, we must separate them from mum and dad, and they actually go into what we call a creche. So this is where they learn to be, they guess, learn to grow up and be adult Regent honey eaters. They learn to be social with other juveniles. They learn how to do those beautiful calls you may be able to hear behind me now and they do learn how to forage. Now after that, after breeding season has finished, they're big enough to be moved into the large flight aviary, which we are currently in. So before they get to here, they need to go through a few little things. So we do what's called a health check. So each individual bird, all those 33 birds, had a health check with our veterinary team. And this meant we took a few samples for DNA sexing, and we also made sure that they were growing up well, made sure their feathers were okay, their beak, their face, they're growing up to be what we expect in an adult regent honey eater. And then before they are released into here with everyone else, we also put a band on them. So this band is for us to tell them who they are, where they've come from, who their parents might be, and will also be their permanent leg band that they will have in the wild down in, down the track. So as you might be able to hear behind me, like I mentioned, it's very, there's a lot of noise going on. It's very vocal in here. This is one of our very large purpose-built flight aviaries specifically designed for these birds. So all of our juveniles came in here to join some of our adults. So we currently have 56 Regent honey eaters living in this aviary. We also have a few other species of bird which are in here intentionally to help our regents learn how to cooperate with other species in the wild. So we've actually got three mallyfowl and we've also got three white winged chuffs in here and very soon we are going to have a few other species that are found in the regent honey eater habitat to coexist in this aviary too. So this aviary is very important step in the recovery program and also the release program. So what that means in here is they can learn how to forage a little bit more, have their native browsers, have natural competition with other species. They'll get their flight fitness up as well. And they'll also be able to be very social and interact with all the other birds in this aviary. So after this year's successful breeding season, we look forward to our next breeding season, which will start in June. And we will make sure that we keep everyone in the loop and let you know how our next season starts out. Well, obviously that was referring to last year's breeding season. Um, and we are lucky to have Monique, who works at, I'm uh, sorry, Dr. Monique Van Sluis, um, on the line, who works at Taronga and is happy to take any questions and give us, well, I think you're going to give us a quick update on what's happening this year with the captive breeding program. And then happy, she's happy to take any questions from the floor. So Monique. Okay, thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone. Good morning. So I think those videos are very beautiful and we have two of our most experienced uh, keepers, Emily in Taronga Zoo in Sydney and Cara in Taronga Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo. So the expansion of the breeding program, just to put in context, a few years ago, the recovery team approved the expansion of the breeding program from Sydney uh, and other zoos. This is a collaborative uh, breeding program that we have with about 10 other zoos in the region. Taronga has always had a lead on this program, on the breeding program, and we and the recovery team accepted the expansion. Well, in fact, not accepted. They saw the expansion of the breeding program to Western Plains Zoo as a strategy to increase the holding capacity and the breeding capacity of the insurance population. So how does this work briefly? Very, I, I won't take a lot of time, just because Emily mentioned that she's the species coordinator of the breeding program. And obviously when we have this kind of uh, program is very structured. So Emily and I share the role of species coordinators. And what does it mean is all the breeding that happens in the program. We have a, 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 a pedigree approach. We know the history of every single bird in the cap, in the zoo-based population, and then we understand we know who are more related to whom, and then we make those breeding recommendations. We decide who will breed with whom and where. 
in Sydney, in Dubbo, or in Melbourne, or in Adelaide. So we have breeding uh, birds everywhere. So for this year, the breeding recommendations were sent to the zoos around May, because the breeding season starts between June, July, and goes until January. So by May, all the zoos know to, need to know who they will be pairing, which male will breed with which female. And if we need to send birds around the country, we have to send them obviously before the breeding season. So this is how it happens from a zoo perspective. Uh, we have, so at the moment we have about uh, over 20 breeding recommendations, so over breeding, 20 breeding pairs. And of these, say 20, about 15, two thirds of those are uh, at Taronga Western Plain Zoo and Taronga Zoo. So we have eight breeding pairs at Western Plain Zoo and six breeding pairs at Taronga Zoo in Sydney. And some of these pairs are together already and some of them have already started the nesting. So the, the season looks very promising, which is, which is great. So we are really hopeful we don't have any chicks yet. I'm not sure if we already have eggs, but the birds that have been paired are doing what we would expect them to do. Um, what else can I say? Uh, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here just because Joanna said that I should address three topics. Uh, so the breeding season. One important component that I want to, to highlight, and this refers also to what Ross may have alluded, I'm not sure I wasn't here for his talk, is the, the zoo-based population, the breeding program that we have, it allows us to do many fine-tuned uh, research and undertakes research to understand their behaviors and what makes a good region honey eater candidate for release. So we already know that when Cara mentioned the big, large aviary, complex aviary in terms of vegetation and other uh, bird species, obviously a region honey, they get social many times along their, li uh, their lives. So they flock and they split and they merge again. So they need to understand what a region honey eater is. They need to understand what wild browse is and they need to understand what other species are there? So I think one important component and which we there has been a recent publication is to understand exactly what makes a good release candidate so that our husbandry, what the keepers are doing on the ground every single day, directs those regions honey to, to be the best release candidate as possible. And obviously this is, is only possible when we have a lot of people working together and collaborating. And this is great. And the other aspect, because I mentioned uh, Ross, is the there's a lot of currently experiments with song learning and called playback, which are being held at, in Sydney and in Dubbo. So the captives, the zoo-based uh, birds, also provide an op under, opportunity for us to understand how can we expose those released birds or all the region honey eaters to the wild songs and call and make these experiments so that we can they can really be the best release candidates or the best birds possible uh, that we can have to release for, for the region honey eaters. So the next release is being planned for October. It's always kind of very dynamic uh, scenario because as, as Emily mentioned in 2019 we had to defer the release because of the extreme drought and the focus is now in releasing in New South Wales at the core uh, currently distribution of the region so we have already shortlisted between 40 and 50 birds because we also know that the more birds we release the larger the release cohort the better it is for those birds to mingle among themselves and hopefully with birds in the wild because they are uh, flocking birds. So I think this is uh, mostly the three topics that Joe asked me to address and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you.
Thank you, Monique. That was brilliant and very interesting. I appreciate all the information. Um, so did anyone have any questions for Monique? There was a question in the chat. No, oh, yes, really? I, yes, I saw it popping in something about chuffs. Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, Monique mentioned white wing chuffs. What are other socially compatible species? Well, in, if you go, I'm not sure who has asked the question. If you go to Taronga Zoo okay. in Sydney, that's fine. We have a walk through Avery that we call the Blue Mountains walk through Avery or Wolomai Avery. And it's a huge Avery, very complex. And now it's already 15 to 20 years old exhibit. So the trees are very mature. And we have budgies. We have say, four or five species of doves and pigeons. We have uh, gang-gang cockatoos. We have, we used to have blue-faced honey eaters, but now they have been uh, moved out from the collection. We have other honey eaters. So it's, it's really, the more, it's, and it's a, a different bunch of species from different bird groups so that they can really learn to, understand that they are not just the only species in the world so that when they are out there they learn to recognize what's a rigid honey and what is not okay great thank you thanks Winnie. um we have a comment i think a request maybe from vicky uh we'd love to hear the songs and calls from the captive dubbo birds <laughs> i don't know whether that's possible to find well out. that's <laughs> something for ross because i don't have any recording myself here, so I, I would recommend if it's not um, Vicky, I'll get um, our PhD student Daniel to send you some. Um, he's recorded heaps over the last few months. Unless Liam, who's on the line, has got any, he might have some. Thank you. Um, I probably do. Yeah, I probably do have some, but yeah, I'll um, have to find them later in my files and yeah, I can send them to, through to Vicky. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Leanne. So the Taronga research team have been using song recordings to assist with call learning. Is there any role for song recordings in uh, set up, to set up and remotely in the KPT area? to draw regions to an area of food and water? Interesting question, thanks Leanne. Uh, I think I will leave that again. I, I'm i not that closely involved on the research itself, okay. on the, uh, but I, that's really another dimension, I would say, because if to put those playbacks in the wild, it's another level of complexity and I'm not sure if Ross with them has thought about that or uh, plans of that. It would be no. difficult. Yeah, we don't yes, really. So the problem is if you, we don't want to, I mean, regions are pretty good at selecting their nest sites anyway. So we wouldn't use core cool playback to try and attract them to, um, you know, areas of food or water. The thing that we would do in theory would be to try and use the playback as a way of helping them learn the correct songs. Um, the problem is, is that what we think happens is that the, the period when the young birds learn their songs when they're between sort of two weeks and maybe eight months old, is that almost generally coincides with the period where they disperse away from the from the breeding areas in the Capity. So um, it would be very difficult for us to be able to play songs to wild birds um, and have them hang around for any length of time to be able to learn those recordings. So um, it's not really possible in the wild, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. That's an interesting question, though. Um, I'm just going to, um, I'm aware of uh, time and the fact that Monique has popped on the line to answer any questions specifically about the captive breeding program. So a lot of these questions, I think, um, are more general. So did anyone have any specific questions for Monique or can we let her off the hook? <laughs> I think you might be off the hook, Monique. <laughs> Thank you so, no, so no, much for joining fine. us. I really appreciate it. So um, 
Uh, we might go to the more general questions, if that's okay, and please feel free to hop off if you need to, Monique. Yes, um, I, I really need to go. To go, it was absolutely. really good to be to be here. Thanks for the invitation, and bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so we have another question from Gab. Uh, typically, do you know how long do the release birds live in the wild? That's to Mick or Ross, I guess. Yeah, well, or Liam. there have been a couple of 2015 released birds seen la last year. Um, and a few, a handful, maybe four or five 2017 birds also seen still getting around. Um, unfortunately, a couple of those are just, you know, in unusual places. They're not sort of doing what they should be. Um, but as far as we know, they can survive for six years. In fact, I think there was a possible 2013 release bird seen last year. Um, they couldn't get a proper look at the, the bands to confirm. Um, so my gut feeling is that they, the birds can survive. It's just whether or not, you know, they're actually functioning in in the wild as, uh, you know, I mean, ultimately the goal of releasing these zoo bred birds is for them to function as a wild bird would to contribute to the population. Um, so survival isn't sort of the only the only factor. I, I think the birds, I guess, to answer the question, the birds can survive into the medium to long term. I mean, the, the lifespan of a Regent honey they might only, in the wild might only be nine years or something like that. So to survive six years in the wild is, is pretty, pretty good, yeah, if that answers definitely. the question. Yeah, that does, definitely. Um... Yeah, that's that, that's great. Thanks for that, Nick. Um, we might. There's a couple more questions, but we have one more talk. I am definitely. I promise you, if everyone who's asked a question um, that we haven't got to yet, I promise you that we will be circling back to them. So, um, but I just want to get through uh, uh, some of the talks, and then we can discuss, have a big discussion at the end. So, um, Evelyn, I know, is going to talk a little bit about some of the projects going on on the ground in the KT. Valley. So, Evelyn, did you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks, Joe. Let me just see if I can figure out how to share. Is that working? Um, can you guys see that? Beautiful. Can, yeah. But it's 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 yes. not. Yeah. Hang on. Why is it not setting the it's not showing the slides, is it? It's not showing the slide show. It's just showing the file sort of thing. But we can still see it. Maybe you can. Yeah, there we screen. go. It just oh, was rather yeah, slow. Good. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to um, talk fairly briefly about some of the work that's going on on the ground in the Caperty Valley. Um, the stuff that I'm talking about is part of the um, Woodland Birds on Farms project that I mentioned earlier that's been running since 2018 um, and is funded through the uh, federal government's National Land Care Program. But obviously it's important to understand that that is only a, a small piece of the puzzle of all the things that are going on in the valley and um, have been going on for quite some time. So um, I think a lot of work started in the 90s when it became really clear that um, the region honey eater was in trouble. Does that it works? All right. So one of the things that um, Central Tablelands LLS has supported in the last few years. Um, but something that's been going on since the 90s are the um, large-scale tree tree and shrub plantings um, run by BirdLife Australia. They're um, run twice a year, and over the time that um, they've been happening, they've grown from a few people planting small strips of trees to over 150 volunteers planting up to 3,000 trees across 
five, six or more hectares. Um, it's an amazing program and I encourage anyone who um, is interested in seeing this in action to join us at the next planting, which may be in August if COVID is kind to us, but possibly not. Um, we'll have to wait what happens there. Um, the other work that um, I'm calling the bespoke plantings, which is basically um, about smaller scale, very strategic plantings that we're working together with Caperty Valley Land Care. Um, so Caperty Valley Land Care obviously has been around for quite some time in the valley as well, but um, more recently, Local Land Services has partnered to deliver a, a tree planting that um, we've identified as probably a gap in the um, in the plantings that are happening on the ground because with the bird life planting we're looking at landowners that are happy for a larger area to be designated for conservation. Um, a lot of the times in in the more fertile areas that um, isn't really something that landowners are particularly keen on, but a lot of the times some of the key breeding areas, as Ross showed in that um, photo that he had with the river, um, the, the breeding areas are near the river and there's a lot of country around the river that hasn't got much tree cover and therefore also hasn't got much food. Um, so we've been working together with owners along the Caperty River and in other key breeding areas to establish what we call paddock tree style um, plantings, um, where we may look at 150 trees over an area of 10 or so hectares, well spaced out, that still allows grazing or other farming activities to happen alongside those trees. So as you can see on the photo there, um, we have a pretty strong guard around the trees to protect them from grazing by cattle in particular, but obviously sheep as well. Um, and the idea is that um, it actually helps farmers as well to have these paddock trees um, provide shade for their stock. So um, we've been doing that for the last few years. And we're also um, branching out into adding shrubs in areas where there's natural regeneration. So um, we often find that the um, eucalypts are quite happy to regenerate by themselves once um, the grazing is removed, but it the shrubs find it a lot harder because they're the ones that first drop out of the system and there's often just none left to provide the seeds to regenerate. So um, that's one of the things that we've been doing as well. Another thing that LLS has been working on is um, improving the habitat that's already there. So obviously we know there's quite a lot of um, habitat out there still in the valley, but it's not ideal habitat. Whether that is that there's a lot of um, eucalypt regrowth that's very dense and the trees aren't able to spread out and develop a crown to really flower and produce nectar, whether it is that shrubs are missing or that um, regeneration in general is limited because of grazing. Um, we look at implementing actions on the ground that can move the habitat to something that may be more suitable for regions and very much other woodland birds as well. Um, a lot of this is fairly experimental still. We, we don't necessarily know exactly what actions are the very best we can do in each of the situations, but we lean quite heavily on the research um, that Ross and BirdLife and others are doing to inform what we do on the ground. Um, one of the projects that we've um, recently, or well, it started a, a, a year or so ago, um, but it's gotten a little bit bigger just recently, is a, a water station project. Uh, we're calling it Water for Woodland Birds. And um, Caperty Valley Landcare and LLS have partnered on this. And um, 
Cabbity Valley Lanka was lucky enough to get funding from the Hawkes Brewing Company to install a total of five watering stations in habitat that um, may potentially be suitable for region honey eaters. The idea was born out of what has been a really, really tough time for all the birds in the valley with virtually no surface water available as the river completely dried up in many areas. And then of course the fires following the drought. Um, so we, we wanted to see if it is possible to provide fresh water to these um, birds so that an area that may not be suitable because there is no good water holes in the area may become suitable um, for birds to use. But in having said that, it's it's a fairly um, uncertain proposal. We, we're still very much learning what's happening and um, we've been monitoring the water station that's been in there for over 12 months now. And um, you can see on the photo, there's um, some rosellas that have been visiting and we have found that um, the birds that have visited this particular water station have been more the, the birds that are happy um, to be out in the open. So magpies, butcher birds, miners, um, some doves, um, the rosellas and uh, magpie larks, which isn't really exactly the birds that we were hoping to attract but we, um, we're trying to understand whether there's modifications that we can do to make the water station more suitable for those smaller, um, more shy birds. And um, we will be looking at monitoring all the um, installed water stations. And um, this is one thing where we can definitely use help um, from people that might not want to be physically planting trees but would like to help um, understand what's going on at the water stations through going through photos and tagging them for us. So just um, to sum up, I guess, the opportunities for anyone to be involved in helping the region honey eaters, um, like I said, the the plantings that BirdLife Australia run in May and August each year are a wonderful place to, to join in and be inspired. Um, but of course, if you do own a property in the um, in the Caperty Valley, and I know um, Kay, who's on the line, is, is um, going to be one that um, a planting will happen on. So if you do have a property that has open areas without trees that you would like to have trees on, do get in touch um, either with myself or BirdLife directly as we're always keeping an eye out for new areas to plant. Um, joining Caperty Valley Land Care is of course a really good starting point as well. Um, Caperty Valley Land Care does a whole lot of things um, from the tree planting to looking after the trees but they also do other things like amazing walks in the valley so you get to to see the beautiful countryside with like-minded people. Um, again, get in touch with me or um, with Caperty Valley Land Care directly. And if there's anything that you feel like you might, you know, want to explore as something that you think you could do to help the region honey eater, we're always interested to hear from people. So um, don't hesitate to give me a buzz and we can have a chat and see what we can make happen. And I think that's pretty well it from me. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's great to hear how we can make a difference in the Cape Tea Valley um, on the ground. So thank you, Ellen. Um, yeah, how do I stop sharing my screen? Did that stop sharing the screen? Uh, no, but I think you need to click oh. on the same button. It's now an X. It will be an X where instead of a, an up arrow. Me. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so, um, we have a couple of questions that, and I mean, I think maybe the best way of doing this might be to circle back to the original questions uh, from earlier in the morning. And then if anyone has any questions for Evelyn, have a think on it, um, pop them in the chat or pop your hand up um, as we get through the initial questions, unless anyone has a 
burning question for right now. Uh, so one of the earlier questions, I've saved them all, was uh, from Leanne, and I think this is a really interesting question that I haven't heard uh, much discussion on yet, which was, uh, has there been any discussion on the songs of the Regent Honey Eaters? Uh, and I think that might be a question for perhaps maybe Mick or Ross. You have to take that. Do you want to kick off, Ross? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a Wikipedia reply. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> there's a lot. Yeah, there is a lot going on, Ross. Do you want to? Yeah, uh, I guess um, we pulled together a paper about maybe six months ago that summarises the songs of, of all the wild birds and compares that to the captive birds and looks at how the songs vary in sort of space and time. Um, maybe the easiest thing is if I provide a link to the video abstract of the paper and then people can watch that in their own time. But basically what we found is that um, there's a proportion of the wild population that's starting to learn the songs of other species instead of regions. Um, and we think what's happening is that where the population is now so small and sparsely distributed that some of the young birds are not having the opportunity to um, learn from older birds um, and then they're just learning the songs of other species instead. So um, I'll leave it at that for now and I'll put the, the link to the YouTube video in the, uh, in, in the chat. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that. And if any, if, um, I hope everyone can actually see the chat um, and the YouTube video that Ross has just posted in. So you can open that at your leisure after this um, event and, and have a watch. Uh, uh, the second question we have was from Megan, which is, has anyone comprehensively birded Turon National Park, which is an unburnt area with some relevant vegetation for region honey eaters. Um, I've had a chat with Liam offline about that. I haven't myself, but uh, I'm imagine I'm just picturing that it's probably not suitable habitat. It might be dominated by even things like ribbon gums, um, that sort of habitat, but potentially along the the creeks and the the, the watercourses, the river. Um, Liam, you, you, there's a breeding record from Turon River. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So on um, on eBird, there's a breeding record from 2001 on the Turon River, sort of just west of the park in that more open country. So presumably they were nesting in Casuarina uh, along the Turon River there. Um, <clears throat> There's a yeah, a pair with uh, three juveniles seen there in November two thousand one. Yeah, so I, I guess you know we're we're always open to places to visit and explore and and try and work out whether there it's you know we're, we're we're constantly I guess changing where our focus is for for monitoring based on what we're, we're finding as we're you know moving around the landscape because there are places that we still haven't visited we're looking at google ogling at certain places thinking geez it'd be great to get in there um so yeah perhaps turon national park's a place that we should at least investigate yeah and Thanks um vicky's just commented in the chat that she's seen regions at Safala in planted mugger so yeah, yeah could be in the area for sure yeah 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 great Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have another question from Gab. Uh, have nest boxes ever been tried with any success? Nest boxes don't really apply for for, for regents. Um, they build a a, a cup nest, um, so yeah, that wouldn't. There's been no yeah no use for for nest boxes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Leanne had more of a comment, I think, which was an interesting one, but I'm not sure whether that was, it, there's a spelling mistake in there, I'm not sure, but um, Leanne says, we have set up watering stations, I could easily put solar recording on them. I think that was related to the question about deploying core playback in the, in the, in the, in the valley. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
yeah yeah okay so i mean you know we we are open to suggestions and and ideas because you know we're we, it's getting to an almost desperate point so yeah i mean we're happy to, to discuss these these things with 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 people that are in the valley for sure thank you nick um so we are now throwing out to the floor i think if anyone has any comments or questions um then uh, turn your audio on and let us know yeah it doesn't have to be just in the chat <laughs> yeah no i know everyone's been very polite and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Leanne, Ross? I can see your hand. Yeah, um, it would be great to maybe have uh, more of a conversation with you. I mean, I'm, I'm an artist and I've worked a lot using solar with sound and light and stuff in some of my installations. But because I've been involved in the, um, the bird watering stations, because there's some infrastructure there, it seems if there was any benefit, it would be something that would be quite easy that I have the knowledge of of how to set up putting some recording and some waterproof speakers and stuff out there if there was a benefit um I, there could be the, it would be potentially a way of just monitoring the use of the, of the water employed by the woodland birds in general not necessarily region it's one of the problems with regions is their songs are really quiet so it's very hard to to detect them and they probably wouldn't be singing um, but birds don't, generally don't sing when they're drinking, so uh, it would be. I would say that the best thing to do would be, depending on how what the entry point for the for the you know, for the birds to drink from the from the drinkers is. It might be more efficient just to have like a camera trap on the um, on, on the on the pool of water, and that that would be the best way to guarantee you can eat all the birds that that come to to. To drink, and I've, I've certainly used that before in Cape Town National Park, where we just put out kind of little little um, plastic troughs of, of water um, with a camera trap, where where we know regions are nesting. Um, it definitely works. So that would be probably the, be the best thing I reckon. Yeah, and that's what we've been planning with Cabinet Valley Land Care um, on the on those ones that have just recently been put up. We did that on the one that was put up last year. Um, so it's definitely a, a, the way to monitor what what comes and goes, and we we will need people to look through a lot of images. So the last camera took over fifty thousand images that um, one of our staff had to go through and sort out which ones were birds and which ones were just bits of wind blowing some leaves around. Yeah, I think I think yeah, I agree. A, a camera trap is a is a, a better option. Or well, maybe you've already got one. <laughs> I suppose it was more of um, a way of attracting or letting the birds know that there was water there. So it was like a calling in rather than trying to monitor who turns up. Is that of any benefit? Where, where are you in the valley? Uh, I'm going to... Yeah, I mean the whole the whole watering thing has kind of changed since um, the rains have come, and so it's there's more options for birds, so they're not necessarily coming to artificial watering points as much, which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things where we can't actually monitor things as well but it's better because it's the route that the explanation is that there's more options so it's just one of those yeah yeah and, and locate like knowledge of where the water is will be will spread really quickly through the bird community anyway once one bird starts finding it they'll there'll soon be others copying so i wouldn't worry about too much about how to attract birds to water yeah. especially yeah. in a drought they'll, they'll yeah. be they'll be desperate so they'll find it especially honey it is they're really good at it I think the other thing that needs to be mentioned about calls is that um, any of that sort of stuff can't really be done unless it's a, a, an actual research project with some ethics approval because we do know that um, callbacks can disturb the, na the normal activities of birds because they feel there's an intruder um, and unless we really know that 
um, we've covered all our bases that we're not negatively impacting on things. Um, we we would we wouldn't want to do that. So I think yeah, if we would be working with Ross. Um, and ANU to do some research around that for sure, but we wouldn't just um, be starting to play calls without all the permits and everything attached to it. Could I ask a question? Um, John here. Uh, uh, have any of the birds that have been released down at Chiltern ended up in the Capity Valley? Oh, yeah. I'm and vice versa. Mick, do you want to go first? Mick, you're on mute. Mick, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, de definitely vice versa. There has been movement in and out, birds from in and out in New South Wales to, to and from Victoria. Uh, there was a bird from the 2017 release actually turned up in Oxley Park in Sydney um, last year. Uh, which is interesting, um, but I'm not sure if any released birds have turned up in the valley, Ross. Did it... then I think there was potential for one yeah. that might have been seen in Geelong Bridge many years ago, but in general, no. Yeah. Um, and even, I mean, we through our monitoring since 2015, we've got a good idea of the songs of the birds now. Um, Vicky's done some work on this as well. Is that it's pretty pretty reliable to, to be able to tell where a bird's come from um, where, in terms of if it's a wild bird from the Blue Mountains or from the Northern Tablelands, because they sound quite different. And again, the captive re release birds sound very different again. So if, if we came across a region honey doing that, that was singing, we'd, we'd almost certainly know whether it was a, it was a captive bird. And, um, certainly, Liam or I have never had any birds that sound like their captive release. Well, they'd be banded anyway, but even if we couldn't see yeah, the bands, we um, um, probably know whether it's a captive red bird. Just while we're on that, I've just um, <clears throat> last week spent a few days uploading a bunch of our recordings onto a um, public database called Xeno Canto, which is um, we can go on there and listen to the birds. So I'll, I'll post the link to that in the chat. For anyone that wants to go and, you know, you can listen to how different the Northern Tablelands birds sound to the KBT Valley birds. And with the birds that have got the trackers on them, have they had you know, large movements or are they basically staying in a similar area to where they were released? So that, that tracking only happens for a short time after the release. Uh, the, the harnesses are designed to eventually break and so the bird's not lumbered with that backpack for the rest of its life. Uh, so we wouldn't really expect to see like long distance movements in, you know, in the three months after the release. But we have we have definitely seen um, some very adventurous birds um, here in the Hunter. Some birds, you know, we're, we're quite happily happy to fly from the release site around Quarrabalong up and over the Sugarloaf Range, almost to Lake Macquarie, and then come back the same day. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It's, it was it was interesting to 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 not necessarily. We know that regents move between regions. We know that that you know they they will they will move large dis distances if they need to, but to know that they will cover pretty significant distances in in one day um, was was a was, was a good uh, good insight. Um, but the longest movements ha have been found not with the, the trackers, but with just public sightings of birds. Um, I'm pretty sure that that Mount Oxley bird is the longest um, recorded distance by a captive Azubra bird. Uh, but there's been other birds in uh, Victoria that have crossed the range and ended up in East Gippsland um, from Chiltern. Uh, another bird's turned up in almost suburban Melbourne. Um, so that so these captive these zoo zoo bred birds will will move pretty reasonable distances. Like it's I guess it's you know it is in their their DNA uh, to not just hang around in the one spot. And that's the thing about <laughs> region honey it is is that you know you could find a a bird one day, go back and it'll be gone. They they they're, they're a very mobile species. And these cap it seems that the zoo bred birds do have that thing that that, that instinct built into them. Talking about zoo bred birds, um, I seem to have mentioned, uh, heard a snippet there from the other lady, Dr. Monique, that 
there were some uh, regents seen close to the a breeding aviaries at uh, Taronga in Dubbo. Is that out of their range a little bit, being out at Dubbo? Or? No, no, that's well and well and truly in their range. There's a lot of mugger ironbark dominated country around Dubbo, uh, and there's been a, a, no, a number of sightings in and near the zoo um, and in other parts of of Dubbo as well. So it's so that to me, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a makes more sense to me, I think, to have larger aviaries out at Western Plains in their range rather than than being sort of stuck in in um, the biggest city in the country in Mossman. Yeah. Oh, on that subject, then has any turned up near the uh, breeding uh, zoo at Taronga? No. no. Considering that they uh, are up around Newcastle, way right? sometimes. Ross, have you? Well, we had a we had a potential. Um, where I was out there about three weeks ago doing some recording with um, Dan Appleby, our student, and we were playing the wild bird songs to the to the to the captive females experimentally and. Um, we both turned round and heard a, a wild type song being played coming from somewhere after all the, um, the the speakers had turned off and it kind of completely messed us up. We we're like, where, where, where's that coming from? Um, but we had to get out of the zoo, unfortunately. So um, I'm not claiming it, but there's there's a chance that we we had one um, a few, maybe about a month ago um, somewhere nearby, but we couldn't follow up, unfortunately. So it's potentially just, just gone away. Just to confirm, John, that was at Dubbo. Oh, Dubbo. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, that that was Dubbo, wasn't it? That was Dubbo, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. All oh, right. Okay. Sure. Yeah, John did ask if any wild birds have turned up around the Avery's in Mossman. Oh, Mossman. Oh, sorry. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not not as far as I'm aware. No. Mm. Just okay. I'll just say that like um, being within range of Dubbo, that historically they bred in places like the Warren Bungles. Um, but I don't think there's been any breeding records out that far west for quite some time. No, right. there was a yeah, there was a pair in in the Pilliga too, um, 2014, I think it was. Um, we um, we actually have a question from uh, Gab, who's got her hand up as well as and and that's you. Have Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I um. Where we live in between the Goulburn River area and the Capity Valley, so it's the Candos Ralston area. So I'm curious as to what's happening, if there's anything happening in terms of the Regent Honey Eater there, because we do have, I mean, there's quite a bit of bushland, there's quite a bit of cleared land, um, but there's also, at the risk of being political, there's a <laughs> proposed mining um, leases coming up for. Um, uh, investigation at the moment up up towards the Goulburn and on the edge of um, Growee and Bre Breakfast Creek sort of area, but sort of yeah. So um, yeah, is there anything happening in terms of the regions up here? Is there anything we can do up here? Um, yeah. I could talk to that um, because I'm familiar with that proposal and. BirdLife Southern New South Wales have just submitted a um, put in a submission about that, uh, and I am also on the conservation committee in the Hunter Bird Observers Club, and we've done we've done one as well. Uh, I mean, they they are enormous areas, uh, and yeah, so I assisted with that and looked at you know Reg Regent Honey Eaters did feature in that submission, even though there aren't necessarily a lot of records, uh, but there is there is certainly habitat and it could it could simply be a case of lack of observer effort. I mean there's a lot of a lot of creeks drain that that western side, you know, at, off off Mount Korakaji coming going west into the Kajigong. There's a number of places and th there are records from Dunn Swamp, for example. So it is it is definitely an area um, that Regent honey eaters would use, and I think Regents will feature if if this stuff, if these proposals, let's hope they don't. But if if they do, sort of head into the future, I think you know Regent honey eaters will feature. And as far as things that you guys could do, I mean, honestly, it's 
there's only so many places that we, that we can cover. Um, and I know that, you know, we do promote survey periods and whatever, but honestly, any time um, that you see eucalypts flowering, particularly along flats, just, you know, just check it out. Like, just look, help us find Regent Honey it is because in the last few years, we've had a few nests uh, found by, by just, you know, the general public. So with with the bird, with so few birds over such a large range, we really need um, people to be on the on the, on the lookout um, for for these birds, particularly around the breeding season um, when somebody might happen and it has it has actually happened in the last few years that someone in the public has found a nest and we've been able to go out and and you know, do some stuff to protect that 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 pair. So. Thank you. Do you. Thank you. Do you know what other birds do they flock with? So we know what are other things to look out for to see if they're there. Yeah. Well, always, always a good pointer are the loud birds. So noisy fry birds and, and lorikeets, uh, particularly little and musk lorikeets. Uh, they are birds that are attracted to to big blossoming events where there could be regent honey eaters. Um, also, white naped honey eaters um yeah. yeah but but really if you I, I guess something that that we do is you know when we're driving around and, and if we hear fry birds or or little lorikeets or muskies they're probably the three main ones i guess um thing is you know like that they could be in flowering paddock trees as well so it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good regent honey at a habitat but um yeah if you're in okay I don't know, Ross, did you, or Liam, did you want to add to that? Um, no, that sounds pretty good. It's a, it, it, it is a good, it is a very good question because essentially you're looking for a needle in a haystack these days. So you really need those clues. And I think those, those birds are, are big clues. And for, out of those three, I'd probably lean towards little lorikeet the most. The little lorikeet doesn't necessarily go for paddock trees as much as the muskies and nausea fry birds might. Um, they're probably going to be in more quality woodland habitat. Um, so little lorikeets are a really good um, bird to listen out for. And all of these calls are available on the BirdLife Australia website and also the website that Liam mentioned, Zeno Canto, which has the calls of just about every bird on earth. And I, I think it's got the night parrot call as well. <laughs> so you, you, you're, e you're easily able to access these calls um, online. And, you know, when you when you are in a landscape that is dominated by trees, uh, it's you, you, you do see with your ears. That's that is how you're probably going to find a regent honey or, or swift parrot is by by hearing them first. So really important to, to learn the calls as well. Could I uh, just ask? Yeah. Um, yeah. Could I ask a question about the uh, noisy fryer birds? Um, like, uh, it came to mind there that they're large, aggressive sort of honey eaters. Are they a bit of an issue with regents as well? Yeah, <laughs> they are now, but um, but that's only really because of uh, the regents having declined to to the numbers they're in now. Traditionally. Regents and noisy fry birds, you know, would would share share bl blossoming trees, and there'd, there'd be, you know, there, there's always there's always a bit of a demographic going on in a large flowering tree in a forest. Generally, the larger birds, like the fry birds and the wattle birds, like to dominate the canopy. The, the yellow face and white napes will be lower down in the tree, and the regents, the regents, when when they were in numbers, they would actually try and chase the fry birds away. They would stand up to them. But because now it's only one, maybe two birds in these flowering trees, I mean, you know, they're 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 even getting chased by the smaller honey eaters. So, I mean, fry fry birds have become, I guess, a problem. Um, but yeah, it's not, they're not they're not traditionally a problem, if that makes sense. No, that's good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'll just add a little bit to that as well, Mick. Um, yep. I just haven't spent a lot of time um, observing regents and fryer birds in, in the Cape D. Um, I think, like, 
So, so my words what? generally don't start to nest until about sort of late October, November is, is my own experience, um, if that's the same as everyone else's. Um, and I've certainly had regions of fry birds nesting in the same tree. Um, but the problem is, is that regions will try to start nesting generally from about August. <coughs> and at that time, if there's fry birds around, then they're kind of camped in these big flowering trees, which are the, the, the trees that the regions are trying to access for, for nesting sites and, and for feeding. And so earlier in the season, what you find is that regions the noisy miners are uh, noisy fry birds are a problem for regions because they'll chase them off from these nest sites and um, feed trees. But later on in the season, when noisy miners are more uh, noisy fry birds are more interested in nesting, then you can get the two two species coexist relatively peacefully. And there's kind of anecdotal um, or theories that at least that regions might even sometimes nest close to noisy fry birds and sort of use the use the those birds as a well indirect way of protecting their own nests but yeah it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty nuanced that relationship between those two yeah species. now that's 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 exactly right and in fact in the last two breeding events that have happened in the lower hunter which is a bit of a bit of a different environment to the KPD and elsewhere in that it's a large remnant forested block so there's no there's no things like noisy miners it's it's just it's just literally forest um the, a good proportion of the Regent Honey at a nest um, in 2007 anyway were actually in, like Ross said, in the same trees as as fry birds. Um, and the fry birds do a good job at keeping a lot of the other birds away. And I, I hadn't thought about, Ross, the, the timing of the breeding because I, I think that's actually very relevant because in 2018, um, the five pairs of, of Regents that, that, although we didn't find all the nests, uh, the timing of the fledglings was that it suggested that they yeah, the, the successfulness of regents were in in november so it wasn't sort mm. of early on in the season so who knows maybe fry birds actually play a, a pretty big part in this so. i've um i've actually got some good photos of, from um kpt valley in uh november 2019 of a female regent honey eater stealing nest material from the noisy fry birds nest in the next tree over so she'd wait until the noisy fry birds went off for a feed somewhere and then she'd sneak over and pinch the nesting material yeah in a in a way like if if you just cast your minds back a hundred years when there were lots of regent honey eaters like in a way regent honey eaters are uh, they're like a small fry bird really i mean they they travel around in flocks and and they're they're quite aggressive. It's just that their body size is the main difference. And that I think Ross, you've looked at body size um, in Regents, but I remember um, Tim Lowe saying to me that you know Regent honey eaters may have been on an evolutionary bottleneck anyway because you've got all these many species of smaller honey eaters and you've got these larger honey eaters for for their body size. What Regent honey eaters do like is actually very unique. Um, so that could have been another thing that's contributed to this. But yeah, I think that fry birds and regents are actually quite similar in, in a lot of their ecology. So that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks, Mick. Yeah. Um. I'm aware of the time. It's only a couple of minutes past 12, but we are supposed to wrap up at 12. And I know we've got more questions like no. Also that uh, Evelyn has a uh, an evaluation form. I didn't know whether we wanted to do one more question. Ev, what do you think? Um, look, I think if, if people are happy to hang around, um, let's just keep going with questions. Um, sure. What I might do is I will pop <clears throat> a link to an evaluation um, that I would love for you guys to do into the chat so that if people that have to jump off, they can jump off when they're ready. Um, we'll also email that link around for those that um, don't get a chance to do it. Um, and that would allow us to just keep going for questions for another 10, 15 minutes if, if people are keen to hang around. And if not, then yeah. thank you so much for taking part and, um, yeah.
we'll see you that sounds time. great yeah thank you Ev. that's perfect um i i might be jump, jumping off but it's been great sharing the morning with you so thanks very much everyone for your time thanks joe mm. see ya thanks joe thanks joe there's a couple of things i might just mention um like just harking back to an earlier question about the shrubs for planting it might be something Ev, that we could take back to the the Capity Valley Ops Group. Um, I'm sure Dick Turner and Ian Patterson would have something to say about that. Um, and I think I think I saw Kerry in there, like she may have joined after that question was asked. But um, and just one other thing I'll mention is uh, there's a mention of the the birds on farm, well, they have the, the LLS birds on farms program. So BirdLife Australia has a, a, a broader birds on farms um, project, which is enormous. It's it's had humongous buy-in um, from landholders in mostly in Victoria, uh, but it's now expanding into southern New South Wales, and and there's actually a meeting happening next week um, to try and see if we're able to get that birds on farms program stretched even further up um, in New South Wales towards the you know southwest slopes and maybe up to towards the Capity. So maybe watch that space because it's a it's a it's a big thing. It's been it's been happening for nearly 20 years. Um, you know we've even uh, put out uh, supplements <coughs> to, our, to our, um, our magazines on literally just on that one project. So yeah it's something to look out for. Yeah, that's um, that's a great thing to um, to mention, Mick. And I think, I mean, the reality is there's there's a lot of amazing work that um, the organisations on this current slide are doing, and we all really work closely together to try and um, get the best outcomes for the birds. So if if anybody is interested in more detail on stuff, um, just give us ahoy um and and keep your eye out for anything that that does pop up through the newsletters and and um the social media channels as well if if you are interested in that um so i just wanted to share this slide briefly and say thanks to everybody who's contributed to today and i will stop sharing again now so we can just go back to questions I think there was a few questions in the chat as well still um, that might not have been covered. There was one question from Kay um, asking about whether nest boxes um, may actually attract birds, gliders or other species like possums that might not be so helpful in the breeding um, efforts of regions. Do you want to say something about that, Mink? Uh, I that thought did cross my mind. Um, it, there's also an issue with other like unwanted birds using them. I know in the Hunter Valley, common miners like to, to move into them. Um, and mostly for birds, they're mostly just taken up by Eastern Rosellas. So all, all we seem to be doing with, with those here is providing more Eastern Rosella, you know, breeding habitat. But I mean, that, that, that might be a, a relevant point um, because we do know that gliders and possums um, will predate a, a regent nest. So yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, I'll just add uh, to that, Mick. Um, one of the problems we have with with regents, as we know, is that you know many nests get predated by gliders and possums, and managing gliders if they're present is really really hard. So one of the possible ways we could do it would be to actually put nest boxes up in known region hunting to breeding habitat um, and then if regions turn up to nest in these areas we could we could actually move the, the, the gliders away temporarily from nesting nest sites if they're occupying those nest boxes um, there's heaps of ethical issues around it and i'm not sure it's feasible in the long term but that's a potential way that we could use nest boxes to kind of actually reduce um, possum and glider numbers in region honeys and nesting areas while regions are present. Yeah, I guess the thing with that is like um, 
you know, if there are ample hollows around already, they may not take it up. That's all. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, John, <laughs> as, as you can tell, we're open to all sorts of ideas here. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, Mick um, or Ross, there. Have you had any um, sort of feedback about the? Cup pied currawongs, they're increasing numbers and that, and whether, you know, I, I seem to remember reading something historical records there that they stayed down at the coast or something and and now there's more food, they move up into the mountains backward and forward more often. And would that corresponding with the breeding season of the region honey eater be another predator that would take a lot of babies or perhaps, is there any evidence about that sort of thing? Yeah, definitely currawongs are a big problem for regions. We've got video footage from um, KFT River of, of um, nests being predated by currawongs. Um, we do actually have ethics approval to, to manage currawongs around region and into nest sites in the same way that we manage noisy miners. But it's not easy um, purely because, you know, the currawongs are sort of coming and going, um, you know, it's something that we have approval to do, but we haven't been able to implement it successfully yet. But um, if we get birds nesting this year, then, then currawongs will be on our radar. Yeah, yeah okay. sure. And I mean, currawongs only actually take nestlings when they're breeding themselves. Uh, but but just to go back to that that point about there being more currawongs, uh, they're they're one of a, a suite of birds that used to be an altitudinal migrant coming down in mostly just in winter um, to the lowlands and returning back to the to the to the ridge country in summer but because of the the amount of food for currawongs along on the coast and and, and off the range they're now resident um, year round and, and breeding here um, and probably that explains you know a an explosion in Chernobyl cuckoos as well, like because the their host birds are now um, nesting down in in Sydney and places like that, and presumably that's why we're seeing um, a lot of Chernobyl cuckoos these days. Um, and just quickly, like so, this has happened before. It, Gould's petrels on Cabbage Tree Island, like once they got the rabbits off, um, the the main way that the Gould's petrel nests were were protected was by shooting currawongs and and ravens on on the island so you know this is this is certainly something that like ross said you know if this season um if we get a currawong lurking around a nest uh, mm. and the other thing about currawongs is they're so smart that they will actually they will follow people around because they know that people were <laughs> are potentially going to lead to a food source so yeah it, it's a it, it's a definitely on the radar but not necessarily easy. Just um, broader things as well you can do for currawongs as well, like in the Cape Town especially, you know, they're most abundant around Glen Davis, around the, um, you know, around the dump, and they love olive groves and they love fruit trees and, um, you know, just in the same way that you could kind of de deter noisy miners by planting the right shrubs in your planting, you could probably deter currawongs by keeping rubbish covered and, um, you know, minimizing plants and things like olives and, and fruit trees. Okay, thank you. Mm. Uh, just spotted a question in the chat that um, we missed earlier. Vicky was wondering whether artificial feeders have been at all considered um, out in the bush, I guess. Um, I know in terms of the capped in terms of the zoo bread releases um that there's been pretty strong opposition against supplementing those birds um just because we don't want them to become habituated to it uh there i mean there could potentially be an argument for um temporary um provision of of, of sort of wombaroo nectar mixes um just to make sure that those uh, release birds um survive the first you know week or two um after release um but we've we've never really tried it with wild birds purely because the the rationale would be is if they found a place to nest the chances are they, they're nesting there because there's already enough um you know that the, the birds consider there to be enough uh, natural food or blossom around to, to be able to nest there anyway so 
Um, we haven't tried it as a short answer. Uh, yeah, it's it's a good thought, and I guess years like the last three um, would have been years that we, we we may have considered it. I mean, we we won't need to this year, hopefully. Um, but I do wonder about what other birds might just use it anyway and then guard it. Um, and like Ross said, it's probably you know food source or you know, availability isn't necessarily the issue. It's more um, being chased away from it <laughs> as they arrive at it, and that may not be addressed by artificial feeders. But yeah. Um, another question that I found in the chat was from Michael, just wondering whether Asian honey eaters have been recorded as having visited or better still breeding in any areas of past plantings in the Caperty Valley. So wh where are we at there, Mick? Um, we've had instances of regents using the trees um, and I saw a bird, uh, sorry, when I say using the trees, using some of the trees that have been planted. So this was a planting along the river um, on one of the hunting dove properties uh, and I've watched a bird actually tearing tearing at some of the, the the bark of a stringy bark type tree that was planted and flying off with it so it could have been using that for nesting material uh, but that's that's the extent um, of usage that I'm aware of uh, um, yep. I had I had that pair in um, 2019 on Binalong, which is one of the more um, well-known, yep. sort of prominent, older sort of plantings in the valley um, on Glen Alice Road. Yep. Um, that was during the drought. They were coming into the dam to drink, but they um, they didn't stick around to breed there. But yeah. Did they feed um, on any blossom, Liam? Did you say that, or was it just the water? Uh, I didn't observe them feeding, but there was a little bit, bit of yellow box flowering there at the time. Yeah. I've had birds in Canobla Gap feeding in planted mugger, feeding nestling in planted mugger. Um, Canobla Gap, for people that aren't familiar, is the, is the kind of the, the bit behind um, Glen Davis in, in Wollamai National Park. Um, I think the birds were probably nesting primarily in association with um, flowering um, forest red gum, but there was planted mugger in there. I think it was planted by David Noble about 20 years ago. Um, oh, really? And it was certainly. Certainly, you know, they're juvenile birds camped in those trees being fed um, by their parents. So. Um, another quick question from Leanne in the chat was about what the range of the regions is these days. Do you want to just summarise that, please? Um, well, historically, it went from Adelaide um, right around south eastern temperate Australia up to roughly the Sunshine Coast, I suppose, uh, maybe even further north. Um, but they're now extinct in South Australia and they're functionally extinct in most of Victoria. They're just holding on really in northeast Victoria. Um, and at the other end of their range, it's probably you know, the extreme southeast uh, corner of, of uh, Queensland, just in the, around the Darling Downs um, near Warwick, there's an area there where regents are found. And occasionally birds will turn up north of there, both inland and along the coast. We had a juvenile bird at Tin Can Bay, right up the bottom end of Fraser Island a couple of years ago. But it's fair to say that really, you know, New South Wales is is where it's at, um, and they they're mostly distributed along the um, western slopes, um, and also the coast. Like you know, depending on the time of year, they're mostly in coastal areas when there's, <clears throat> pardon me, things like spotted gum and swamp mahogany on offer. Um, so you can actually easily find this if you go to uh, the BirdLife website, we, we have a couple of publications. We have a, a thing called Saving the Regent Honey Eater, a conservation guide. That's 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 a, uh, I call it the recovery plan in a magazine. Um, it's a really great resource that talks about all the stuff we've talk, talked about today. You can find a link there. And there's a range map in there. Fantastic. Thanks, Nick and Ross. Um, look, 
from what I can tell, that is covering all the questions that were put in the chat. Um, and given the time, I think it's probably um, time to wrap things up unless someone else still has any burning questions um, that we want to address. Um, Leanne just put in the chat to see whether we can get a link to useful habitat plans to propagate. Um, yep, I'll, um, I will probably be following up an email with some of the links and things that we've shared and information so that people can have a look at those things. There was also a comment about the um, Birds in Backyards YouTube um, videos where people can see what sort of birds are um, visiting the Caperty Valley, including been along um, the planting there. There's quite a lot of um, footage collected there, so we'll share all that information. And if anybody has any questions um, that haven't been covered, feel free to flick them through to myself or any of the presenters directly, and we'll do our utmost to cover them. Um, so if that's all, then thank you everybody again for joining us. I hope the online format wasn't too painful. Um, at least we got to get together and learn from each other. Um, so thanks very much and particularly thanks to the speakers for sharing all their knowledge. Sorry, Ev, I'll just add one last thing that we we only really touched on mistletoe today, but we are planning to, ha to have a standalone workshop down the track on on mistletoe because there's yeah there's a lot to talk about there so it's, and it's really fascinating but, so yes down the most track. definitely um hopefully this COVID business will settle itself sooner rather than later so we can get back into uh, running workshops and um i'll i'll include some of the um information materials that um bird life and lls have pulled together about mistletoe as well um to share in the email that follows this webinar. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much. I'll um, I'll see if I can finish the recording. But um, yeah, just well, oh, Ian, you put your hand up. Was there something that you wanted to say before I shut it all down? You might be waving. <laughs> Maybe that was it. All right. Thanks, everybody. See ya. <laughs>